award-winning magazine. Uh, uh, unlimited flatbed toes for all of your classic cars. Valuation tool. And uh, VIP events and shit like that. Yes, so we okay. must be talking about the Hagerty <laughs> Drivers Club. Um, we are, we're to, well, we're probably supposed to be doing the um, uh, the plug for HDC, but I, whatever. I, we I, just I, did. I can't find it. Yeah. We just did. Well, there was something else. That, link below. There we go. Okay, so <laughs> being that we are super prepared for today's episode. Of we, the Carmudgeon Show, part of the Haggerty Podcast Network, which is hosted by Jason Camisa and Derek Tam-Scott. I have my laptop out because we resolicited Q and A cues uh, some and weeks we ago, A's? and we will be aing those cues today. The question will is: Will we just be bullshitting our way through this, or will we actually do research? Research. Well, look. Last week we did the whole nine eleven like spotter's guide, everything you need to know, and everyone's like, "Oh my god, we want even more from Derek." People seem to appreciate actual knowledge. Yeah, but that wasn't research. That was just kicking around loose in my brain. <laughs> That's because we're going to answer the question very quickly that comes later is, are we actually this much of nerds in real life? And the answer is... Yes. More Regrettably. So. More so. More so. Mm-hmm. Yes. Right. Okay. Uh, stay tuned. Listen to a little dee, 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 and we'll be right back to answer questions. Super. Okay. Hi. Good afternoon. Didn't know the episode comes Good out. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, unless, unless you're, you're in, in Europe, Europe yeah. or Australia <laughs> or Asia. Or somewhere else. Anyway. Um, first things first. This situation and this ghetto ass solo cup situation. This is just water by the record. Uh, by the record. For the way. <laughs> and by the record. Um, well, we're off to a splendid start. I have start. a gift for you. Oh. This is a Yeti that is Haggerty branded and says shit happens with a sh- shitter or otherwise known as a shift pattern. Huh. Um, and from now on, we are going to drink out of these. And they, they were sent to us probably passively aggressively by by my cool. boss at Haggerty. But also I was like, oh, fine, they're cool. Yetis, whatever. But, you know, we drink cold drinks. But then I found out that all proceeds from these mugs go to teaching. Hold on. It was like enclosed in the thing. It was like, hey, um, these tumblers are for you and Derek to take with you to the studio. All proceeds from the tumblers will be donated to help teens afford driver's education so they can experience the freedom, independence, and fun of driving. Hmm. And I am sorry. I approve. I am not usually one for bullshit. Like, I, you know, like call bullshit <laughs> well, out that's like not that. Bullshit. That's bullshit. That is a cool cause. Yes. So um, I don't know if there's a link below because i don't know what the link is and actually we don't have anything to do with the haggerty shop but you guys should really go to the haggerty shop and buy some of these things because the idea that this company tagline is never stop driving uh and And in fact start to driving is the opposite of that or they're doing all these different so we were the last episode that we recorded live together was the detroit episode yes Um, and so there, there was the porsche episode in the middle but we haven't gotten to talk about the sort of post of that Detroit. The debrief from the Detroit Concord. The fact that there were cars there that anyone who could, anyone who could just drive a car could just drive these classic cars. Like this is putting money where the mouth is. And that was really, to use a technical term, fucking cool. Yeah, Uh, I agree with that. I mean, I am always one to complain about how having cars displayed exclusively at Concord is sort of a... I don't know. I think it's a little bit misguided. There's a there's this generational handoff that needs to occur and putting up barriers uh, between people and new people, especially in cars, is, uh, I think, regrettable. So it was nice to see that this was executed uh, in a way that encourages new people to get involved. Yeah, of course, by new people, you mean young people, and they're not going to understand the words you just said. You're just yes, going to have to be will. like, it's fucking rad that this shit is on TikTok. Or something. Well, okay. No, well, but it I is. wouldn't know. You are closer to their age than I am. So, <laughs> the I mean, if you think about the what, what was that guy? Something exotic. So the guy that was just taking tax the rich. Oh, yeah. Back in the day, this is somebody who was like doing donuts in yes. you know Testarossa. He was and the F40s and, Enzos and yeah. Phantoms and stuff. Yeah. Um, and we never saw who he was. Right? I don't. He think wasn't so. ever on screen. You yeah. just saw them ripping around through the mud in these expensive cars. But that was a really great example of just taking a car that's out of reach of most people they're never going to see and doing with it, doing something with it that's going to wind up in the eyeballs of the next generation of car enthusiasts. Mm -hmm. That was really cool. 
And uh, because of the irreverence. People love irreverence. Well, that was, I mean, that was secondary. But yeah, and normally people who are like, this is an F40 and you'll never be able to afford it. So I'm not showing it to you because you're a stupid peasant. They, this guy was like, let's do, let's do the same shit. I am a car enthusiast. I don't know who the person was, but the person was saying that effectively, I'm the same as you. I'm just fucking rich. Yeah. And I'm just going to do stupid shit in my cars the way you do stupid shit in your mom's car. Yes. Which was rad. Um, uh, yes. What else coming out of Detroit? Younger generation. Yeah, we met some design students at CCS, which is, um, there are, uh, let's see, two really great design schools if you want to become a car designer, uh, at least in the United States that I know of. CCS in Detroit is one, and the other one is Art Center in Pasadena. Mm -hmm. So people who are asking, you know, young people who are like, how do I get involved in automobilia? If you have design talent, then you would try to go to one of those two schools. Mm -hmm. Uh, anyway, there are students there, and I guess they get free tickets, which is kind of cool, to mm -hmm. the Detroit Concours, and that's neat because you know they live in a sphere where I think they're obviously super up-to-date on what's going on and the latest trends, uh, but I think getting them also some exposure to the sort of legacy was is super helpful. They seem to certainly get value out of that, too, so yeah. it was nice to see them all there. They brought a life-sized cardboard cutout of you <laughs> with you on my shoulder that's right i would uh, that was not life size yeah. <laughs> well you're not that big in person um, <laughs> no that was really i was so impressed with all of those guys and girls they were um it gives us you keep hearing stupid fucks in media saying oh kids aren't into cars bull shit this was a generation this was a whole group of kids who were intelligent and articulate and cared about all these wonderful little details of the history of cars, the current situation of the market. They had fantastic questions for us, one or two that will wind up in episodes. Um, what a wonderful surprise. And for me, to, I hate all humans. You just run screaming from them and only talk computer language. Um, and we both hung out with these students all day. It was great. So. Yep. So the kids are all right, it seems. I mean, it's we Futures any of us hands. any of us who sort of interact in the car world now. I mean, all the boomers were hand wringing about you know kids who aren't going to be into cars in the future. I think that's proving not to be true. You see social media and what happens on there. There's plenty of spotters with cameras. I mean, everybody. It seems to have be as alive as it ever was, and I think maybe more so in some ways than mm -hmm. a decade ago because of the entire media that has developed around people generating content i really cars. think i think i've said this before i know to you but i think i've said it on the show this whole feeling that this the next generation of children is not into cars came from one fucking study it was seeded by one study where i think it was new york times or some other uh, i i uh, this makes me very angry there was a study that asked teens to decide between their internet connection and a driver's license. Like if you had to choose which one, and that, that is asinine on the face of it. It's like saying, Derek, would you choose between your car or having electricity in your house? And of course you would choose cars, but you're weird. Most people would choose electricity. And they, whoever wrote that fucking study didn't see access to the internet as a sort of given utility in the same way that we have water, running water and electricity. Sure. Well, just you you get a new place, what are you getting? You're getting an inter internet connection or you have a phone that has unlimited data first before you even turn the water or the electricity on. So it was just a badly written study. And of course, everyone, 90% of all the teens chose an internet connection. I'm surprised it's not more. Or, I mean, even something. for me, it's like... But I think that, that that badly written and badly executed study really did plant a seed of, oh my God, kids aren't interested in cars. That is absolutely not the case. Period. Yeah. Uh, every cars and coffee I go to, every, every, every event we go to is yeah. just completely disproving yeah, that. Yeah, there are plenty of youths around. Yes. They're just into different things and maybe that's something I'm that... I'm not sure they are. Uh, well, I mean, they're not running around being like, oh, I would like a Jaguar XK140. Yeah, but I don't think anybody under the age of 90 has ever said that. Yeah, but the people who sort of inst instigated this whole sort of crisis or apparent crisis were worried yeah. that there was not going to be a generation there who's like, oh my God, 67 GTO, yeah. coolest thing ever. Yeah, because like, it it's okay to be into these cars that... You know, people described as video games when they were new in the 80s. And now it was like, oh, my God, so cool. Yeah, but so, I'm, I'm, I couldn't give a rat's fuck about a 1918 
Franklin, or if that was even a thing in 1918. I don't know. I don't, I don't care about these cars. Yeah, and I think yeah. there's a generation of people who don't care about the 50s and 60s cars. Yes, yes. Doesn't mean. That's fine. What the hell? Somebody just sent me a meme the other day that was really upsetting. Was the the idea that a car in, no, oh God, what the hell it was. A 1991 Civic is now the same age as like a Model T was when something else came out. It was one of these like 30 years, yes, 30 years. Yes. Yeah, it's like a, a 50s car and an 80s car. 40s car and 80s car are now 40 years apart and 40. Yeah. Anyway, anyway, okay, that's not where we're here. No, we are here, in fact, to answer uh, some cues which were posed many episodes ago now, maybe three episodes ago, because we solicited some Q&A cues mm -hmm. for in the, I think it was the Lotus Mira episode. Uh, so we, I have pasted a number of them. Some people ask more than one question. Uh, we will answer more than one for some. We will answer zero for others. It's my discretion. Sorry. Okay. If you <laughs> you have been ignored, blame Derek. That's right. Uh, send the hate mail in my direction. And or your question was too long or you didn't write it in good enough English to, for it to make sense. And I <laughs> for a couple of them we were it. like, uh, <laughs> what does this actually mean? Yes. Okay. Uh, okay, uh, the first question is, are you two really as nerdy in real life as you seem on YouTube? Yes. Okay. No, we're nerdier. Okay, yeah. that's fair. Uh, next question. That was easy. <laughs> uh, are cars that will never be used for their intended purpose lame? So this person offers examples like GT3 RS, uh, 4Runners, Land Rovers being used, um, but also Dakar 911 not getting used as intended. Uh, or, you know, that sort of thing. So the sort of, like, poser thing is basically the question. Okay. Well, I mean, I love a good G-Wagon. G mm -hmm. uh, it, that's technically designed for off-road use. Mm -hmm. No, it's not lame. It's cool. Yeah, I agree with that. I think you also, like, Forerunner is a very good example of this because you look at the other stuff that's in that space, uh, in terms of price point and like usefulness and people really like forerunners they have high resale value because it has something about it that's different identity authenticity those things are true regardless of how you use it it's a bit of a shame to not and and you know this the flip side of this is like think about supercars right not getting used as intended are those lame mm, yes so here's the here's here's i think where i differentiate something like a forerunner is an on-road vehicle and it was designed to be driven on road with off-road capability right i mean it's designed primarily as an on-road car you're okay. giving me a dirty look i don't think something like a pagani zonda was designed to be driven on the road yeah, That's but a they're not like really track cars either yeah they're designed like as a, piece a lamborghini of jewelry. okay right lamborghinis are not track cars generally and so what are they some of them are really fucking good on track yeah uh, ventadors aren't but like uh i mean svj might be but like yeah huracan that's an interesting one so like a supercar that never gets revved past four thousand bucks yeah that sucks four thousand rpm, RPM. <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, sleep deprived once again uh, um I mean, people, we talk about how people use cars as avatars, right? As an expression mm -hmm. of yourself, as, a, as an expression of your identity. No car ever is going to get, not no car. Most cars don't get used to their full capability, right? They are engineered to survive, you know, Belgian pavé and salt tanks and all this stuff. You know, people aren't going to use all of the capability of the car. And if your choice is a Highlander or a Forerunner, you know, the Grand Highlander is probably the same kind of money as a Forerunner or something like that. And one has better resale value or, you know, whatever, more identity. Or you're saying, making a statement, or you're having fun, or, you know, it makes you happy. Then, like, okay, I can kind of see that. I think there is some tragedy in a high-performance car that never gets used to its full potential, uh, especially if it's, like, squirreled away for collector value that's a little bit of a disappointment but ultimately consumers can do whatever the hell they want and if your makes you happy then i suppose you can do whatever you want with it I this was the tragedy of talking to an amg engineer about the stuffing the v12 into everything and i said mm -hmm. you know how like how how what problems do you have cooling these things on like when you're testing them a nurburgring the six six liter turbocharged v12 is going to create a lot of heat and he's like oh no that's not the problem the problem is air conditioning load in la and i was like what and he was like yeah 67 or something whatever it was the vast majority of all v12 mercedes were sold in los angeles metro area and the problem they the biggest problem they had was getting enough airflow through the radiators to keep the engine cool so that the air conditioning would still be cold 
that was their biggest thing. Yeah. So 100 degree LA traffic uh -huh. with a full AC load on that. Yeah. Like, wow, that's really sad. Like that shouldn't be your primary concern in a, in a 600 horsepower car. But, but it's a real it use is. case. Yeah. Uh, we didn't really answer that question. I think fundamentally, they, are they lame? No. No, it's but it is It's a little bit sad, posery. But. It's a little bit sad. Uh, but there's some beauty in knowing the car could do that, right? Let's let's bring this to Ferdinand Piech. Let's talk uh -oh. about the, God the, damn it. the VW gonna... Phaeton, which is supposed to go 300 kilometers an hour when it's ambient to 50 Celsius at, and maintain an interior temperature of 22C or yeah. whatever it is supposed to be, whatever the criterion was, was. Uh, to... to design that car's functionality but it's only capable of 250 kilometers an hour it's got a limiter on it so like people just like knowing that same with the veyron by the way i yes. mean the veyron was capable of a lot more here's people like knowing that the thing can do it because well because that pays dividends right the fact that it can do that means that you in the normal use case are never going to run up against the thermal and so people who are buying system. four runners feel that way when they're driving around and like it might be bad it's weather or people driving a gt3 rs on the track be like it has a lot of grip and, you know... It's the reason why German cars have been so much better than most other cars dynamically for so long and it's mm -hmm. and so much tougher. It's because they have to survive the Autobahn and surviving at redline, at full engine output for 100,000 miles is something that American cars in the 70s, 60s, 70s, 80s could, certainly couldn't do. Um, so the dividends were the cars lasted longer in the real world use case. But I'll let me f turn this whole thing around. What about people who drive a pickup truck and will never put anything in the bed? I think that was actually one of the examples. I mean, that's probably being that the best selling vehicles in the United States are pickup mm -hmm. trucks. And no it's the ever, same thing. Yeah, same These thing. are all the same phenomena bit sad. playing out. I mean, it's just about how it makes you feel. That's what yeah. people buy things on, on a largely emotional basis. Yeah. And then they use their brain power to come up with a justification for yeah. why it makes sense to do or what they just, actually just want to do in their heart. Yeah. Or it's just, and that comes from society. If you're you know a man in Texas, you just drive a truck, period. Mm. You don't have a car. It comes from a variety of places, society being a big one. Interesting. So, I, yeah, I think to answer the question, it can be sad, but mostly it's, you know. It's just the way we are the way as humans. Uh, okay. And this, and the same person also asked, why is the M2 uh, so much better than the F80X generation M3 and M4, even though they have the same powertrain and suspension? They didn't initially have the same engine. So the M, so the F, the F80 series M3 was early in the BMW sort of turbocharged to lineage, mm -hmm. the way that engine's boost hit was a light switch and the rear suspension just couldn't take, couldn't cope with it. And it was the same thing with the F10 5, M5. Same thing, as soon as the boost hit, you were fucking sideways. And I think BMW had to straddle, all car companies have to straddle the line between fast turbo reaction and smooth turbo reaction. So BMW's priority or M's priority was get that boost as high as possible, as quickly as possible. And it's since been toned down. The M2 started out with a non M engine. So it wasn't an S58. It was no, that wasn't, they were S55. It was a M54, M55, M55. God, there's so many, I don't too know. Many BMW, so whatever. So, to me. Right. So it's past it was, the era of me it, giving a shit about It was BMW. a non, it was originally the single turbo non M engine. And that was, I don't think it had a 54, which is a twin turbo. But either way, it, the boost hit much more gradually on those engines. The M2 competition then got the M engine and I liked it less. It, mm. it had the same sort of issue of when the boost hit, it was kind of out of control and it was not so linear and didn't sound as good. Um, so I think that's what it is. Okay, so it's about boost arrival. It's about boost arrival. Plus also, through the years, BMW has gotten better and better and better at harnessing that torque. And so the current M3 is spectacular dynamically. Spectacular. But it took them a but whole generation to, to, have to get there. And then you see the grill. Yes. It is almost time for that time of year where we can watch Hocus Pocus. Ah, yes. Every time I see the front end of the M4, I just think of Winifred, Sa Winifred Sanderson. Yes. Uh, okay, next question. What is the best BMW and the worst BMW you have ever driven? Oh, worst would have to go to um, M550i of the current generation G. 10 i can't remember what the code is uh i had one i made it four miles and blew a tire because i hit a 
relatively small bump that everything else was fine on and uh, put a replacement tire on it and then went on, did my little bumpy road test and I had to abort. I had just had a Camry the week before and blew through this twisty section of road like at 90 miles an hour, it's a 25 zone, I was probably doing 30, um, at high rate of speed and it just dealt with all the bumps and everything was totally fine and the M550 smashed into its bump stops so many times so hard that I just had to give up and say, forget it. Um, the car was not, found out later the car was not fully tuned. The, there were too many variants of wheels, tires, powertrain, so engine and all wheel drive versus uh, rear wheel drive versus manual. Too many variants of the car and the only suspension tuning they got to do was a simulation and never got to that car in the real world it was mm. fucking terrible um so wow. that's worse bmw what about you i don't know i mean i haven't driven that many modern bmws maybe there was a bad old one <laughs> uh i'm consistently underwhelmed by both the cs and the 2002 to drive the e9 okay. yeah but they're are they they're bad? not bad no, no. they're not bad uh, okay, uh, F thirty three twenty I I guess Ugh. it just it was interesting because Corolla. I kept getting those as yeah Corollas basically I kept getting them as loners when I had a E ninety three thirty five D and it was so interesting because I was like man they put all these people who have you know the last generation three series into the new one and I was like it's such a relief to get back into the last generation car when I would pick up my car from the shop and so I was just like man that it's they're really going the wrong direction but the I think the majority of consumers are undifferentiated who buy those cars and they don't sort of pick up on the dynamic or quality things. They're so, their perception is so much shaped by the fact that they're in a BMW right. that they just, and themselves the, the 320i like was a great marketing stunt, right? There was a 328 and or a 330. And this was the sort of cost cut base level car to compete with the front wheel drive CLA and front wheel drive base CLA and Audi A3 sedans. And so BMW actually won that comparison test from when I did it. Um, uh, those three cars, the 320i won because it was a size and a half bigger and it was for value for money. It was there. The value was there. Was the ultimate driving experience experience there? Absolutely not. Yeah. Um, best BMW ever driven. Oh God, that's annoying. It's got to be dynamically. It's probably current M3. Really? With an automatic, which is really fucking annoying. Mm, um, I haven't driven any new 328. BMWs. Which generation? The original. Like the in 1939. E36? No. Oh, yes. 1930s, 328. Yes, yes. Those are wonderful. That is... I really like those cars. I drove one with a with a Volvo gearbox, though, with Synchromesh. Mm. So I don't know whether the original I, gearbox... I don't know what the fuck I drove. We were rescuing cars out of Sonoma when there was a fire. Mm -hmm. um, there was a fire that was surrounding this, uh, this wonderful guy named Jim Smith, who's since passed. He was in his 80s, and he, was, he and his wife were on the roofs of their houses with hoses, hosing the roofs down because they were cedar shingle, and any spark from the nearby fires would have burned his whole their compound down um and so we were just any car that started we just ran over to the sonoma raceway and anything that didn't we dragged over in tow trucks and i just hopped in the 328 started and drove knew nothing about it mm -hmm. was completely confused because i'm like i thought this was a 30s car like it's and it drives like a 60s car and i was so i was so confused fucking spectacular yeah those uh, are really wonderful yeah. to okay. drive they sound great they just like you say, it's like time travel. 30 years ahead of where they should have been. Yeah. yeah. So amazing. those are wonderful. Okay. Um, of more conventional BMWs, I would also nominate, like, I really like a good E36 with a six-cylinder engine. I'm a big fan of that experience. Yeah. Okay. E39 with a six-cylinder. E38. E39 any, any E38? I did, is less exciting to me. But E38s, I, I really actually... A life e 46 a give me any yeah. of them yeah oh, yeah but okay uh okay this person is uh oh car centric society what are your opinions on the idea of making it harder more expensive to own cars in the city to promote city safety walkability or other modes of transport this is a very non-car enthusiast it's very a num toddy question actually a what uh, question? num tot new urbanist memes for transit oriented teams these are the people who are like anti-car <laughs> and pro like public yeah. transit and ride around on, on trains and stuff i love trains and i like transit so i think it is very luxurious to be able to drop make i think junk miles are dumb applying miles to my car that do not 
bring joy, I think is a, is a bit of a waste. And so living in, I live in the city of San Francisco and I drive, you know, I try to make it so that I'm driving mostly for fun wherever possible. And so not applying junk miles to a car, I'm actually okay with. I like being able to have the car be dedicated and focused on enjoyment and not have to do sort of day-to-day things. Uh, that is valuable for me. So I'm, I'm okay with uh, improving mobility and transit and making cars be for enthusiasts. Okay, you fucking hypocrite. I have known you for, we've decided, what, 12 years? 15, whatever. Long time. Has your ass ever taken a fucking train or a fucking bus or any other subway or any other public transit in the city of San Francisco? Yeah. Don't even. Of course. Shit, I was hoping that wasn't the case. <laughs> I mean, I used to live a block and a half from BART. I used to take it all the time, time to get to the airport. Okay. That's taking something outside of the city. Muni, which is the network of trains and subways and shit in San Francisco, never. I've F never market? seen it. Hmm? F market? F is a PC. trolley a trolley car on. That's public transit. Okay, you'll take it? Yeah. How often? I don't know. Whenever I feel like it. Okay, you go to the gym a lot. I walk. I, ex- exactly. You're still not taking public transportation. But the, but the point is that it, this, the in, uh, urban environment means you don't. it's not car-centric. Okay, so... We are going to do an episode, whether you whether you like it or not, from in the back of a Waymo. Because I just did this, and it was fucking wild. This is the driverless, driverless Jaguars. Jaguar uh, I paces. That was unbelievable. We're gonna we're gonna talk about this. this is a fucking great question. Um, I am totally happy to relinquish all driving to public transit and other ways to get these fucking imbeciles out of my way and let the computers drive the car because they're better than the fucking humans. Um, but that's why I live outside of a city because I don't want that in my everyday life. Life. So. Okay. So you're Good. not a, num- you're not a, a numbtot. Great question. Uh, okay. What is causing brands like Alfa Romeo to create cars like the 33 Stradale uh, and only make 33 <laughs> examples? <laughs> yeah, just sheer idiocy. All right, this should be executed as a... Yes, I agree with this. As a 6C uh, instead, more of a volume car. Like Basically, the question is, why make such a cool car and then only make 33 units? Because it's a nothing but a money play. And unfortunately, I don't know if you know this, but we are in a situation in this world where there's a, uh, a big disparity in wealth between people. And there are a lot of people who are really fucking rich. Yeah, but wouldn't you want to make more of them? If you made more, you could sell them for the same price. Think about no, Porsche GT cars. You no, could. I don't think so. Have you noticed that there aren't a lot of cars in between the like 250 and million dollar range? But there are a shit ton of cars that are like two, three, five, seven million dollars. They make it just rare enough that they can inflate the price through the roof so the really rich people can have them and they can say, oh, well, they're only making 33 of them. If they made 300 of them, they'd have to sell them for, which would be 10 times the volume, they'd have to sell them for less than one tenth the price. And no one has that kind of money. You either have billions or you are the rest of us. And so that's, I think that's a wealth disparity money play. And I, Okay. By it. All right. Wow, I could be an econ- economics teacher. <laughs> uh, why <laughs> are like <laughs> why are some cars mostly American, slower in a straight line than their competition from Germany, Italy, etc.? This is kind of like I'm not maybe sure not true, but also have you heard I of think Hellcat? it also raises. Well, they're not. They have struggled to put power down. Have you heard do of a Tesla Model S Plaid? That's American. A Lucid Air Sapphire. Well, those are EVs. It's I think this cars in the world. Uh, raises a question that actually arose in the episode that we recently went live, your Drag Race episode of the Mercedes 500e versus the uh, M- E34 M5 versus the Audi RS2, where you get results that don't sort of seem to make sense on paper because of real world concerns. Mm-hmm. I will hand it over to you here. Uh, so the outcome of that race, if you guys haven't seen that episode, and you should see the episode because it was really a lot of fun. Um, and a surprising result. A surprising result. The car with the worst power to weight ratio fucking destroyed the cars with the best power to weight ratio. In fact, the one with the absolute best, uh, which should have won, finished DFL. And that's a really great example of numbers telling part of the story. There's a real world component to cars that just, well, the Don't numbers, map. you have to look at the right numbers, and that's like sort of area under the curve. Which you're not going to get from a peak horsepower and a peak torque number. Correct. Right? Or, um, and from a curb weight. Right. And that's, you know, you today you look at BMW's uh, power ratings, and, you know, everyone everyone sort of, quote unquote, knows that BMWs are underrated. Right. Um, and it may or may not be the case. It could be, you know, it could be 
it, certainly they make a lot of power and certainly there is evidence that they may perhaps make a little bit more but bmw rates their cars in the worst case scenario so you're always going to make at least that much power mm -hmm. um but i don't think american stuff is slower than anybody else at this point no, I don't think it's specific to country. I think it's more specific to the powertrain and whether it's boosted. And I mean, you drive a fucking Raptor R. <laughs> yeah, it's not slower than anything. Yep. Okay, this person is asking: uh, as we head towards EVs, how will manufacturers differentiate their cars to stand um, apart from each other, even if they're all having the same powertrain? Are we generally headed towards just sameness? We've already been head heading towards sameness for years. Have you noticed that every car on the road has a 500 cc per cylinder direct injected four valve per cylinder turbocharged, turbocharged with a high gear count exactly. automatic transmission it's behind it? Just everything has a rack and pinion steering setup. Everything has struts up front unless it's really expensive. I mean, automotive homogeny was an episode that we did mm -hmm. um, early in the days. And yeah, that's absolutely where we're heading there. They can differentiate themselves with who does self-driving better and more smoothly than someone else. Mm -hmm. or subjective characteristics i will say that our experience in the lotus electra was interesting mm -hmm. because there was genuine character difference with that car compared to other evs yeah. that are in that sort of size and but other weight than category. the brutal firepower the rear wheel steering which i thought was torque vectoring mm -hmm. um it was really just how stunningly beautiful that interior was mm -hmm. and so really that becomes the usp is who makes a nicer interior and that smells better sure yep uh, okay, what distinguishes a sports car from a supercar from a hypercar? I have opinions. I do too. Um, sports car historically, ugh, depends how far back you go, it was, it was intended for sport. It was intended for competition. Uh, now I think we take the word sports car to sort of mean a certain type of elemental experience. And it's not about absolute speed. It's more about uh, enjoyment and sort of closeness to the experience of driving. And uh, a supercar to me is sort of kind of has to be mid-engined at this point. Uh, and it also has to have an element of sort of like exoticness and sort of not usefulness. It has to have the 14 year old boy effect of just being like, holy shit. Wow. Uh, and those cars, you know, in retail new sort of maybe starting at 150 and, you know, up to, you know, under a million. And then hypercar is like an, another level beyond that where it's like for people who are used to seeing exotics all the time, that still impress those people. And those are kind of seven figure cars, generally speaking, and exist at, to sort of push the limits of automobile possibilities generally as well. This is all sort of notional. It is notional, I, but I don't agree with, uh, disagree with any of that. I think hypercars though are really the, the poster cars, right? These are cars that exist. Something like Pagani, you know, when see was the them? hypercar invented somewhere between the Veyron and the Pagani Sonda. I would say somewhere in that in late that 90s. Yeah, because at the, if you think about when the Veyron launched, it was a million dollars and everyone laughed like and by the way, Bugatti was losing three million on each one at that price. Um, no one will spend a million dollars on a car was the thought. And now people are spending three, four, five, ten plus. Um, and is a McLaren F1 a supercar or a hypercar? I think in its day it was a supercar. It was only 500 grand. It was 640 pounds. Oh, okay, whatever. So I made that up. Whatever. I just make everything up. But it wasn't, I mean, it was really expensive. Maybe that was a hypercar. I think maybe also as holder of the world's no. fastest. No, it wasn't. It's it was actually a sports car. It's actually a sports car. <laughs> yeah. So, all right. So the way I see it is it's, it, what's the. So they're not mutually exclusive, completely yeah. exhaustive. No. Me see. They're not, they, they don't cover all, some cars can be more than one of those yeah. things. I mean, I, to me, a sports car is something that prioritizes the experience. And that at McLaren mm -hmm. F, F1 absolutely did. That was Gordon Murray's goal. Mm -hmm. It accidentally wound up being the fastest car in the world, but that was never part of the target. Correct. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's priorities. Priorities in a sports car are experience. Priorities in a supercar are numbers and Impact. performance right and prior in uh and hypercar is absolute cost no object let's make this a piece of jewelry or make it engineering jewelry. engineering jewelry yeah yeah okay um did the woman who hit your honda beat ever face judgment not that i know of i'm still 
the, her, her, the the name and address on that police report is burning a hole in my pocket. Oh God! Um, <laughs> but no, no, never, never done anything about it. I don't know. Hopefully, okay. hopefully she's dead. Uh, do, 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 do. This person <laughs> That's is asking. Terrible. I'm sorry. I don't mean that. I do. I know you do. I don't. <laughs> I can't say that. Uh, okay. This person is asking. Um, is there anything about the experience of electric cars that could be fixed with a transmission, automatic or manual? No, it gets worse. Yeah. No, electric cars don't need transmissions and are worse for them for it when they have them. Okay. How did you multi geared st- transmissions? Right. Yes, exactly. Uh, how did you start writing for a magazine? I've been interested to write about cars for a long time, but I don't know how to get started. We did an episode about this. Yeah, quickly, it was a friend of mine um, named Mike Duchesne, who was the uh, online editor at Automobile Magazine. And he was looking for a uh, for a replacement for the Motor Trend uh, online editor. So Motor Trend and Automobile were the same uh, magazine company. So it was a friend, effectively, friend. is the answer yeah. to your question. Yeah. Um, and I had been running a website and just did a sort of IT business first. And he nominated me for the role to work alongside of him. Ultimately wound up leaving for Car and Driver, leaving a hole at Automobile. And I joined. So it's really... Uh, and I had met a bunch of people at Automobile prior to that, including Gene Jennings, the editor-in-chief. Uh, right so place, right you know, time, plus you know. having the knowledge and, and it's expertise. It's, a, it's always who you fuck. Okay. Uh, no there was a casting couch involved. It was, um, it was something you care to forget. No. Okay. <laughs> well, sorry like, for de- digging up that That is track. not funny. There was, I was not me too um, Okay. Um, is there a future for hydrogen ICE cars with the use of electrolysis? I like this question, actually, because I shit on hydrogen cars. But the, the short answer to the question is yes, if we get nuclear, if we get fusion, basically. Uh, it's Hydrogen is easy to make, but it takes electricity. And right. so the question is always like, should you just put that electricity directly into a battery car instead of spending a bunch of energy on... Um, turning it into hydrogen or making hydrogen and then unmaking that hydrogen once it's in the car or if you're if you're doing an ICE car with hydrogen then you're not doing the second part Uh, I could see that future being there if electricity is cheap enough which you'd need fusion I think to do because then you get to save internal combustion engines powering them by hydrogen and you get that experience and there's not this sort of minus uh, associated with them which is villainized which is the carbon emissions part so if you can get nu- if you can get nuclear fusion and basically unlimited free cheap electricity and save internal combustion in the process, then yes. Uh, unfortunately, you're wrong. I mean, and here's why: human nature will always tend towards the uh, towards efficiency, and the amount of electricity that it takes to create, store, and and transport the hydrogen will is last I checked, which was a couple of years ago, more than you'd need to just transport the fucking car in the first place. And so as battery technology continues to improve, um, or even if it doesn't, we still wind up in a situation where the most efficient thing to do is put it in an EV that has two moving parts versus 4,000 moving parts. And so while I and I love internal combustion, you love internal combustion, it's chapter in terms of new products for transportation is just over. I could see there being a situation where manufacturers seeking to differentiate themselves without the specter of carbon emissions say, we're going to make a product like this. This is like Porsche yeah. just hanging on with a manual transmission. Just say, we're going to create this thing because we know people want it and we'll buy it. And it actually makes financial sense, even though it's not the most efficient outcome, right? There's people who go out and ride on steam trains on weekends. It's just this. Por- Porsche's pushing hydrofuels, uh, biofuels, right? I mean, I think that is. same. It's the, the other side of the same coin, basic idea. which is a different fuel that doesn't have the carbon impact that allows internal combustion to persist. Right. And I think what that is, is hanging on to what we have as long as possible. And I'm 100% let me let me make that clear 100 percent behind that but i think for traditional transportation purposes agree it doesn't make sense yeah not for mainstream vehicles not for mainstream but i could see it being a thing yeah. for enthusiasts. so long cars. as it doesn't get outlawed um but i think that the situation in europe right now is so aggressive against anything that has combustion happening yeah. that i don't see but there's like this sort of you get a little carve out if you're like a fuel cell people are sort of like okay alternative fuels right alternative right. fuels if you just couch it in those terms i think it's less villainized yeah. uh question for jason which of your cars is easiest to work on uh the 30 if it didn't we have this once before yeah maybe we talked I think about we did this. the 30 yeah. if you if it actually had a had a hood that didn't open the wrong way 
Probably 30, though. Yes, we, that's we, right. We, we did recently there. do this. Uh, okay, someone is talking about how we talked about how the CT4V Blackwing is so spectacular. It would be improved if it had a V8, so why aren't you guys big alpha chassis uh, Camaro SS enthusiasts? Because that's basically what that car is. Uh, it's a lot bigger. I is mean, it? I'm an enthusiast of that chassis. I think that and Zeta. I mean, all of GM's recent rear drive platforms have been wonderful. Um, everything from a ATS-V to a CTS-V to all of this, the 5V, the uh, 4V, and Camaro, they're all spectacular. Uh, the problem is just size. I don't want a 4,000 pound enormous uh, coupe. coupe. That you can't it, just doesn't, it's just a personal sure. preference at that point. So um, no reason to not buy one of those if you enjoy the experience. It's just that the whole purpose is that it's a f sedan. And so you get a level of practicality and, and, and joy in the same car that makes it sort of really one car solution-y. That's very yes. nice. And remember geography. We live in a place where the roads are tiny, the parking spaces are tiny, and a Camaro is sure. just too big to live with here. Sure. So okay. that's part of it. Uh, this person has an NA Miata and says, best practical daily under 40K newer used. People How practical? Question. Yeah, exactly. What is your definition of practicality? Where do you live? Do you need something that is suitable to your year-round use, where somewhere where it snows, or you know? I mean, if they had a Miata, if they have a Miata and they're looking to upgrade to something else, it's a hundred percent. No, it's, it's it's a second it's oh. a second car to yeah, go because, with an NA. Miata. So I would just get rid of the Miata and get or an NA. Yeah, that's a problem. I'd get rid of the Miata and get a, a BRZ or a GR86. I mean, that's like that car just keeps coming up. I can't yeah. stop thinking about it. Yeah. Um, but more practical. But that's golf. like. Yeah, I guess. I mean, how do you get more practical than a golf? CTRs golf. are too expensive. But that's a really you get nice a used one. That's under forty. Yeah, that's that's tough. I mean, listen, under four. I just had a fucking Camry rental. It's so annoying. <laughs> and the thing was so good. Forty miles per gallon on the highway, <laughs> eighty miles an hour. Like, there are so many choices. Mazda CX fifty done. I mean, I want a manual, and you can't get one in that. But CX fifty with a turbo, pff, under forty grand, great Tesla Model Y. Yeah, this needs more qualification. Yeah. Uh, okay, three cars before nineteen ninety that can collectively capture the old car experience that's lost in modern cars. Man, that's tough because it depends on what you define as the old car experience. For me, the old car experience is you get out of the car and you smell like fuel because it's carbureted. Well, there were okay. Yeah, so the carbureted thing you're going to have to mostly remove because ninety there was by nineteen ninety there were very few carbureted. Well, cars before left. ninety, so to me that leaves the like a hundred year period before nineteen ninety. Oh, yeah, I think about that. And okay. so then it's like, man, like the Miura is an assault on the senses, or like any sort of sixties carbureted sports car. It could be a candidate for that. A big block Corvette, you know, something with mm -hmm. seven liters where the car rocks when you that's rev a, it. Like, I think a, that's a little bit too broad of a question. I because, agree. But I could, but here you could say an Alpha 105 car is basically all the misery of, of old car ownership in one beautiful 2,000 pound package that sounds great. Yeah, I just, for me, I would not want a four cylinder for noise reasons. Okay. I mean, but then you can have 40,000 bucks. God. No, no, no. There's yeah. no, 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 no dollar limit. Yeah, well, it's just three cars before 1990 that collectively capture the old car experience. I agree. Okay, collectively. Little... Hold on. This is a three car solution. Then. Is it? Yeah. Okay. That collectively capture the old car experience. Mm. Wow, that's okay. If we interpreted the question correctly, if we did collectively, shit. Well, then you need to have something like an American muscle car, a V12 Ferrari, and a four cylinder Alpha. Interesting. Okay. I think you would. Mm, no german no no german didn't peak until yeah i think i think like a 68 camaro just because it's so fucking gorgeous <laughs> i mean some like american muscle car kind of a thing plus what's the first yeah the furthest thing away from that would be like an alpha four cylinder yeah or a lotus uh seven or something like that yeah. Really light and like barely a car. And if it's got to be a three car solution pre 90, it's going to be a V12 Ferrari of some sort with carburetors mm. on it. Interesting. I, I could rock that. Okay. All right. I see that. Uh, okay. 
Which companies have done the best job of carrying forward their founders' legacies? Which ones would be unrecognizable? People are talking. So he's also asking about the Ford Mustang uh, and the 911. Why is the 911 outpaced the Mustang in refinement? Well, because it costs more and it's designed by in, en- Germans. Well, in refinement? Why is the 911 generally outpaced the Mustang in refinement, reputation, and desirability? It's about quantity that was manufactured and the like innovativeness of the engineering. Well, hello. One's a $100,000 car as a base car and the other one's a $26,000 car as a base car. You just just answered that question yes agree okay um, mustang is a car that has not deviated from its roots yeah. I'm, I'm about to do an icons on on it and this was a fun one to really think about what is so different about s650 the current car um and really going back and looking through mustang there were a couple times where they came ford came very close to really fucking it up and didn't. You're talking about Mustang I'm too. You're talk talking about. about, talking about any I know what you're talking yeah. about. I'm not talking about any of it because I want you guys yes. to watch the episode. But Ford got it, like saved it. Must even Mustang too wasn't actually a fuck up. It uh, was a sign of its time. Correct. And we'll leave yes. it there. Um, yes. But it, uh, yeah, Mustang too. 911 is kind of drifted more than Mustang has. I would say more than Mustang has. I agree GT with cars that. haven't. I mean, the nine, the G, like a GT3 is closer to the Definitely. 911 definition historically. But 911's drifted. It's big. It's heavy. It's not as heavy. But it's just grown into a luxury car with a lot of automatic transmissions. and Sure. Um, yep. So what car has most accurately kept up with that? I um, mean, there I, are I think s- they might be actually separate questions now. What, which companies have done the best job of carrying forward their founders' legacies? Well, BMW's done the worst. Yes. I think they say BMW's deviated from what they should have been. Mm-hmm. Porsche's doing a pretty good job. Porsche's doing a great job. Porsche has a, a done a great job at adapting to a new world mm-hmm. um, and remaining But keeping on the North Star mm-hmm. in the same place. Yeah, because even the cars that should suck, like a Macan, is great. Mm-hmm. Um, and it embodies actual driving enjoyment and it is the car that in that category is the yeah. most fun to drive yeah and i would say ferrari has strayed um lamborghini strayed a lot with well with the from what though because lamborghini had two starts right lamborghini well, had the no, four- they had one start it was the 350 gt, GT. yeah and the right. miura already it was like they lost the plot <laughs> Well, yeah, exactly. Mura is completely wrong for the brand, and that was mm-hmm. not what Ferruccio wanted. But then it came to define, to the, define brand, the brand, and then it has persisted most recently. And now the best-selling Lamborghini of all times is an anus. And yeah. so, Eurus, I can't let's get that wrong. Yeah, I think, but Lamborghini's, like, if Lamborghini's job is to be outrageous, it's done well. Um, yeah, interesting. Mercedes had some, some straying. Yes. Honda has strayed, and is trending back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Nissan. Ooh, so sad. Uh, Nissan, together with Honda, both in 1964, were like the arrival of Japanese cars on the global market. Honda does F1 for the first time, mm-hmm. and Nissan wins uh, the race, yeah. second race ever. Uh, and then Nissan is basically its prince doing the their debut of the Skyline uh, GT at uh, the Japanese Grand Prix in 1964. And so Nissan, together with Honda, was like the origin of Japanese enthusiast mm-hmm. cars. And they have very much lost that. Uh, what about modern Citroën with like the DS brand? The problem is those cars I don't think are that technically interesting. Yeah. And they suffer from the sameness convergence, right? There's like mm-hmm. sort of miscellaneous little superficial features that are weird, but it's not advancing engineering and design and just reshaping the automotive landscape the way that they yeah. did in the mm-hmm. 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and into the 80s. Aston Martin, Jaguar. I'm I mean, Aston Martin to... has been through so many permutations what that it's really it? hard yeah. to uh, yeah. clarify or distill what is Aston yeah. Martin's identity other than like... Elderly British things made in a shed. Jaguar's done shit. <laughs> Elderly British things made in a shed. Yeah. Um, uh, Jaguar, that's nope. interesting. They've done a shit job. They've done a shit job. Yeah. I'm just kind of thinking of different brands. I mean, I think Chevy has stayed true yeah, to what it is. Okay. For, you yeah. know, mass market cars, mass market Volkswagen, cars. actually. VW is straight for a little while under Piaget to its benefit. 
right? I mean, yeah, but they never abandoned the core, which was the Beetle. There are two cars that they have made, which is the Beetle and the Golf. Yeah. <laughs> I sure. mean, that's, those are the only two cars Volkswagen has ever made. Obviously, that's not true, but... But they form the basis for Yes, that else, is yeah. the a core. I mean, huh. the people's car, right. the car of the huh. people. Um, that's an interesting question. Cool question. Yeah. Uh, okay. This one is definitely for you. If you could design your own six-speed transmission, what would be your ideal maximum speed in each gear? Oh, I think I answered 41, this one. 42, 43, <laughs> 43 44. <laughs> look at V12. It's a six-speed. Mm. Look at V12 Vantage S manual slash yeah, and Miata. then just drop the seventh gear and yeah. then the car goes 150 it, instead of 200 miles the, hour, the max speeds were the same as nd1 miata so i think it was like 38 which i would probably shorten quite a bit uh to have a much shorter first gear and then 52 and then 77 and then give me a fourth gear that gets me to 100 yeah and then fifth a big jump to wherever six needs to be for cruising so you know so you want maximum a, speed in fifth or sixth uh it depends on the car i mean so a car that does 200 miles an hour i want maximum speed in sixth because i don't want to be cruising it you know it, it all totally depend on uh, the power output but mm -hmm. what i like is cars that have big drops between fifth and sixth for example so you know you're not going down a gear for nothing going up a hill you you know i'm in a cruising sure. gear now i have a big jump and then a big jump I'm to fourth to is torque. totally fine yeah because in the U.S., once you're at 100, 120 miles an hour, you've already lost the race. I mean, it's over. There's no reason to ever go faster than that in yes. this country. And you want to be, when you're going between 20 and 60 miles an hour, you want a lot of gear changes yeah. in there so you can interact with the engine. Exactly. Uh, okay, what can we in the enthusiast community do about the way the average person drives? Support self-driving cars. Support self-driving cars. <laughs> And I think make it a lot harder to get a driver's license. I mean, you need only mm. to look at the difference between the United States and Europe to see the way that how much more skill the average driver has. I mean, yeah. you see dumb shit happen in Europe for sure, but the baseline level of skill and awareness and competency mm. in Europe is so much higher, and it's because it's so much harder to get a driver's license. Yeah, and the problem in the U.S. is that we run into a freedom yes right restriction we don't want to make it difficult for people to get a license because we feel like everyone should be able to afford to have a license and so making it difficult means necessarily making it expensive and, it's and that because means our public transit system sucks well, so bad that was, you, and our I built was, environment means that you have to drive i was to gonna do say anything. that's the the real problem is that you know like new york i don't remember i don't know what california is but i studied the new york driver handbook mm -hmm. and it must say 16 times on every page don't forget that driving is a, a right privilege not a privilege a privilege, privilege not rather a than right. right yes but the reality is it somewhere in between because yes. you Here, can't function yeah. in the united states without a car in vast sections of the united states it even is required. the bay area i mean the bay area is one of the few examples where you can sort of function without a car mm -hmm. and yet everyone without a car occasionally zip cars or yeah. you know that you can yeah so unfortunately it's it's a uh, reflection of a bunch of decisions that were made decades ago by politicians and leaders of business yeah. so you could support uh I don't think there's a way support out. efforts that promote uh, people's ability to live without owning a car because there's a lot of people out there who drive not because they want to but because they have to right and then unfortunately then we have ubers and they tend to be you know at least in this area tend to be the some of the worst driver taxi drivers tend to be the one of some of the worst offenders here anyway so yeah self-driving the only mm. way out mm. okay here's one for you yeah. What are some of the most out of character cars for a country or manufacturer? That's an interesting question. I huh. think the LFA, that's the one that immediately comes to my mind, right? What is Lexus supposed to be? Their their design ethos is like sort of comfortable, civilized, out Mercedesing Mercedes, and then you get in the LFA and it's like an eleven experience. So in terms of just stimulation and, yeah. and all of that. So I feel like the LFA is really discontinuous. Mm hmm i agree with that uh with lexus this is one that probably should be in green so that we can think more about it we can it. do the whole episode but do i mean urus i would say Lam uh, lamborghini urus it's shit interior it's quick but it's just not actually a lamborghini it's so obviously a volkswagen product mm. um interesting but at, but at least it no 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 hold on i'm going to redact it, that because yeah. at least it's within it's trying to be outrageous it doesn't really succeed at, at what it was but what it should be doing but it that is. was less yeah that one to me was less compelling for that reason i mean phaeton yeah that was a big fuck up i mean it was just you can't have a 
car company. It was called Volkswagen, the people's car, and then make something that's an S-Class competitor. I think yeah. those, that's... Especially numerous. when you have Audi in-house and Bentley right. as well. Yeah. Oh, my God. I think we could do a whole episode on this. Okay. We'd have to I have really changed it this. to green highlighting nice. okay. such that we can revisit like this. That one. Uh, okay. Um, 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 one what was more? another one about Mustang versus 911? Didn't we already... We had one. Just about the only cars immediately identified from the show. Oh, this is from the per one of the people we met in Detroit. Okay. Okay. How do you make a new gen... Oh, this is talking about the design icons that have persisted for a long time. I think about this question when you think about the new Beetle or the Mini or mm -hmm. Mustang or 911. How do you make the new one new but also still continuous with the last generation? I think it's very difficult. I and agree. I think that's what Ford just probably ran into with the current S650 Mustang that looks just like it's it's a new car. I mean, it's new. It's at the same. It's platform. new, but it's new to be new instead why, of because it's better. Right. Somebody yeah. obviously was saying, don't fuck with it. The last one worked. Just don't fuck with it. Just add a bunch of like curves and kinks and shit for no reason. Sure. Um, but there have been. I'm trying to think of a good uh, golf. I mean, golf is a great example. That car yeah, has evolved. Mark Seven is great, and then Mark Eight they did the same damn thing where they were just like, "Now we're going to change it, not because it is better, but they because it, it is different." Well, part of it is I think what they. Yes, I the think reason they I, this has historically been all, also a thing is that like the main lexicon of car language has changed over the years. Mm -hmm. I mean, you think about the what cars look like in the '70s versus the '80s versus the '90s. There's like a sort of step function where things really change appreciably over each of those ten year periods. And I feel like the last ten year period, there's been less of that sort of seismic shift in the sort of way that cars look. You are thinking. I don't think it. Well, obviously, other than the fact that SUVs have totally taken over. I mean, sedans are dead. That's one shift. And the other shift is design elements that are very 3D in nature. So you have, or styling elements, I should say more than design. So a lot of cars just don't work in, they just do not work in two dimensions. So you see like pictures of the new insert, whatever, and you're like, holy shit, that's horrible. And then you see it in person, it actually looks pretty good. And so computer aided design, which is, happened for a long time but the, the fact that so many of these cars are designed virtually and the wind tunnel stuff is done virtually and all simulation stuff means the car companies can do things that they've never been able to do before and so you'll see shapes like some of toyota's design language you know lexus's design language that's kind of crazy mm -hmm. but actually works in person so that's a, a difference but i think there are there are so, so many cars that have so successfully continued to look like they should look mm -hmm. um oh and the other thing that i was going to say is proportions of cars have changed dramatically with evs so the skateboard platform tall toad looking car is becoming very normal right the, the original tesla model s did this spectacularly hid that mm -hmm. and model three and model y so you mean what like polester two polestar, Pol polestar two yeah. has that yeah. vibe um, we're just getting used the to the ev6 id4 volkswagen yeah they all look like toads they're very tall and they're it's a strange proportion that we're now used to seeing my mm -hmm. sister just bought a model y which is fucking wild because she's in, i hate how those things look i hate how they look too but i was a hundred percent behind yeah, it's this perfect. purchase it's a perfect transportation device it's yeah. safe i don't have to worry about her driving it you know or getting hit with somebody in a she's in south carolina and i six thousand pound pickup truck hits her in her stick shift mazda six and we got a problem six thousand pound hit, uh, truck hits her in a 4800 pound model y i'm a lot less concerned sure um but um you know she's like people are judging me and this is all weird and like everyone's looking at me and she wants to get oh, like a custom. she's in the south yeah and I'm whereas like, here you're like it's so anonymous number one selling car in where we are is model y and followed by model three they're fucking everywhere yeah but that had that not been the case we would all be doing what is happening to her in south carolina would oh that thing looks like a toad it looks like well, it's weird oh it's really expensive I and mean, people are really scared of it um but Range Rover has done a fantastic job of evolving to current consumer tastes in all of the styling language for the JLR product of the Land Rover. Like a Defender is fucking gorgeous. Um, Velar is beautiful. To all me, that was less successful than I wanted it to be, the Defender. Oh, but really? I guess this, it's the standard is set by the Mercedes G, and I'm like, you know, that's no one. change at all. Yeah. Basically, is the Very standard close. that I use. Uh, and so, you know, the question, the core question is, how do you make a new generation different enough to excite, but still uh, recognizable? You have to figure out what are the th elements. It was interesting because I watched a video in the 90s about the, from the, where the designer of the 993 generation 911 was interviewed and was asking, you know, 
what, how do you do this? Basically, it's the exact same question, but 30 years ago. And he says, you know, we return to the original design and we say, what are the elements that we really like and that are in keeping with the ethos of the company? And what are the things that we've sort of had to change over the years because of, you know, less pure reasons, mm -hmm. whether they're safety or, you know, whatever, uh, and sort of choose what elements are really critical and essential to that mm -hmm. design and which ones are sort of like functional requirements or get changing with the times and we're fashion of that era or something. And you say, like, what is the core identifying elements? And I, I mean, now I think designers are sophisticated enough that they do a pretty good job of this. I mean, the, the key, one of the key elements of a 911 is that the passenger compartment should be narrower or Yes, that yes. The, the, the glass house should be narrower than the passenger compartment should be narrower than the wheels. Right. right? There's this, so you get this, the hips. Right. Yes, you get hips and you get this sort of tumble home, I mm -hmm. guess, as well from the, the passenger compartment being mm -hmm. narrower than the doors. And there's this curvature. So you sort of have to figure out what are those core elements. But then, you know, if you've done a really good job last generation, then then what do you do for the, well, the I mean, next one? And the I mean, that's why they only made two new Beatles because after that they were like, um, "What do we go? Where do we go now?" The, yeah. and, and or the mini. Warning, the well, mini I was going to bring up in a second, but look at nine nine six. Right, nine nine six has all the core elements of a nine eleven design without the round headlights, and mm -hmm. it's still the red headed stepchild visually. Yeah. Right? And now they've gone back to round headlights. 992 is gorgeous. I mean, it's just a beautiful car. They've done it really well. I think Mini has done a good job of... So to call out one thing that I think that they, they did in that case, which was something I appreciated, because you look at 992 and 991, you're like, mm, they're not that different. But what they did do is they went to the square hood opening on the 992, mm -hmm. which had not, you know, which was part of every air-cooled 911 and disappeared... Uh, kind of with the 996 and but it was something that had they they looked back at the original and they say okay what's an element from the original that we like that we want to sort of acknowledge or bring back i was just going to say exactly that the most successful designs i think are the ones who aren't just looking at the previous generation but who always go back and look at the first yes so mark one and mark two golfs were very similar mark three was a departure mark four heart their design inspiration was mark one again um, and then was five, it? yeah, really? four was the closer to one. They brought back some of the, the kink in the door opening, matching that rear, uh, yeah. that rear corner. They went as close as they felt they needed to, to Mark one, Mark five straight again, it became, it looked bulbous perverted. and perverted. Yes. Six was, um, a, a, a fix of five which was extremely successful it's to me extreme, unbelievably successful. and then seven they just did the same thing but more in it was well, just seven perfection. was a clean sheet design. i know it's shocking they were, because six and seven look so related yeah, and but, five and six do not but what they did was they took the the ability to build in a bigger dash to axe ratio axle ratio just change the proportions of the car for the very first time but go instead of looking back at six or five or four they looked at one and four so seven was designed to be in the lineage of one and four mm. and ignored, and ignored five, everything six, from five, three, right. Six. And even two. And that I think was great. Nine eleven does that same thing. You sort of have that. The square hood is a look back at the originals. Not no one's looking back at nine, nine, six or even nine, nine, three and saying, how can we, you know, in, how can we put some of this stuff in? They're looking. I see a lot of nine, nine, three. I mean, of course, 993 was an evolution of the original 911, but yeah. there's what they're doing is looking back through the whole catalog rather than right. and, and the highlights, say, not just at the previous. Mark 8 is only looking at 7 and yeah. saying, how do we change 7 yeah. for, for, the, for the purpose of changing it? That's a fuck up and it will wind up being an aberration in, in the yeah, car's design. Yeah, it's be like the Mark 5. Yeah. Or, or then, you know, 996. Yeah. But sure. Mini's done a great job at keeping that aesthetic going. But yeah, but they really all, I can't job. tell them apart. Right. They all look the same to me, and that's the problem. Well, no, the R53, for sure, I think is the most attractive right. of all of the new minis. And then they just kept sort of making it more cartoonish and yeah. more blobby and right. more sort of like w less crisp. Look, I have a hard time telling 991 and 992 apart. There are, there are different angles where I'm like, oh, hold on, it takes me a second, right? There are different Porsches that do... I can't tell any of the minis apart. And R53 here, is the only one, the first right. of the new ones. And the, the new ones, I just don't know why I should buy one. Like yeah. why, unless I had a previous one that I want to replace with a new one, I just don't know what new they've brought to the table. So they haven't actually done a good job at evolving the car. They've done a good job at keeping the style, but I don't want one. Mm -hmm. um, that's, a, that's a great question. Well, it's that's from one of the people we met in Detroit. One Thus of wrapping designs. us around and yes. proving that the future is in good hands because these are these kids are smart. Okay, that's it for this episode. The, I don't know, 114th-ish or so No, episode. 114 already have 115. 
Okay, episode of the Karma. I only know this because I have to put the number in on the thumbnail, and I'm always like, oh, if I forget to do that, people are going to crucify me. Yep. Um, Bye. See you next week. See you next week with more Q's and A's. Uh, Do we have anything else coming up? Mm, We should maybe talk about the Bruno Sacco event on November 12th. We are going to do that, right? I mean, we've committed to it okay, at this point. Okay, we got to do it. So we just so have to mandi- choose a location. Mandatory Mercedes content. Yes, we're doing a Bruno Sacco <laughs> 90th birthday party here in the Bay Area. This will be on his birthday, which the is November 12th, 12th. Sunday. Sunday. We don't know what we're doing <laughs> or where we're doing it. I mean, uh, there'll just be like a car. It'll probably just be a parking lot full of Mercedes Benzes. Yeah, but we are still fun. trying to find one of every body style of cars that Sacco did in Smoke Silver, just so we can make this group photo and jrg um okay join us next week for another episode of the carmudgeon show part of the Haggerty podcast network and uh don't forget to go and buy some cool yeti cups because we want to support teenagers blowing out clutches <laughs> they're replaceable yes the so teenagers, are teenagers. <laughs> <laughs>